Have you ever heard a story that you just can't stop thinking about? A story so wild that you remember exactly where you were when you first heard it. For me, that happened almost five years ago. It was a hot summer day, and I was at the beach with my friend Amber, an old college classmate that I hadn't hung out with in nearly a decade. We were slung over foam noodles up to our necks in the Atlantic Ocean, catching up on work and life. And at that very time, my life was very different from Amber's. I was overworked, underpaid, living in a tiny but very expensive New York apartment with two roommates. Amber, on the other hand, seemed remarkably settled. She had a great career in marketing, a husband, and a gorgeous apartment in Brooklyn. And that day in the ocean, just as I was thinking, God damn it, how does she have it so figured out? Amber turned to me and said, I have this crazy story to tell you. Um, And I just remember you just being, like, your jaw was on the floor. What Amber told me practically knocked me over. It blew up the image I had of her and her idyllic life. And that story started in 2015 with a simple gift. Amber was spending Christmas with her husband and his family in upstate New York. The way she describes it, it seems like something from a Lifetime movie. The whole family was gathered around a sparkling, perfectly decorated evergreen tree. Before them, a sea of presents. And tucked away beneath the Christmas tree was a small, neatly wrapped gift box for Amber. She peeled back the holiday paper. I just remember being really excited when we opened it. Inside the box was something that Amber had on her Christmas wish list, a home DNA kit from 23andMe. Both of my mom's parents died really young, so there was a lot of kind of blank uh, space on that side of the family in terms of our genealogy um, that I was just curious about. My husband was just kind of along for the ride. What Amber didn't know that day, surrounded by jolly relatives, hot pastries, and kitschy Santa decorations, was just how much that small box would create chaos in her life. And that's because this box revealed a secret. I mean, were you, were you going to tell me? When you get down to asking with the truth, we have to tell you the truth. Just wish you never asked it. Um, I just, I mean, I need to like process all this. You might think Amber's story sounds familiar, and that's because it is. More and more people are doing at-home DNA kits, and the results can sometimes be shocking. But this isn't a story about a 23andMe kit solving a cold case or tracking down a murderer like the Golden State Killer. It's about medicine and technology, and in some ways about playing God. I feel like I live in this insane sci-fi, you know, X-Files fantasy that I, like, didn't create and didn't, like, I didn't create this situation, but I kind of just have to roll with it. This is Biohacked, Family Secrets. I'm your host, TJ Raphael. Over the last four years, Amber has allowed me to document her journey through a series of interviews as she's wrestled with a family secret. Something really big is happening here, but I couldn't put my finger on it. That secret was hidden away for decades and perpetuated in part by a highly profitable but largely unregulated sector of the American medical system. I'm the product of a selective breeding eugenic science experiment. And the more I dug into that system, and Amber's story, the more bizarre things got. 
the idea that you could unwittingly marry your cousin, that's concerning. And that's when it really clicked for me, the magnitude of this. He's already fathered more than 100 children. I wasn't some like freak one-off situation. This was happening to like thousands of people. An Ohio woman suing a sperm bank for medical malpractice. They had all been lied to and they were all finding out through commercial DNA testing. We dive into Amber's story next. Stay with us. After Christmas, Amber didn't waste any time doing her 23andMe kit. She spit in the tube and mailed her DNA sample right away. She waited weeks for the results. And then one day at work, she checked her personal email. And there they were, sitting in her inbox. She opened her results, and what she saw surprised her. Because the first thing that pops up is your ethnicity, and it said, you are predominantly Ashkenazi. Um, No one in my family is Jewish. I grew up in a town with one Jewish family, so I was shocked. So I thought, you know, maybe my grandmother was just Jewish and and we didn't know. My mom was like, well, you know, you can't really, you can't really trust those tests. I mean, how do you know that they're real? And I was like, it's a DNA test. It's literally how they convict murderers. (laughs) Amber had a strong suspicion that her Ashkenazi lineage, which made up a quarter of her results, came from her mother's side of the family. Remember, both of her maternal grandparents died when her mother was young, So it was possible that one or both of them were Jewish, but no living relative knew that. But that theory was quashed when one of Amber's cousins, from her mom's side of the family, also did a 23andMe test. And then it turned out that she was not Jewish. So that kind of eliminated to me that it was not my mom's side of the family. It was my dad's side of the family. If this piece of heritage wasn't from her mom's side of the family, then it must be from her dad's. But there was just one problem with that. My dad comes from a long line of Dutch people. His father, um, who has passed away, would always say, you know, if you're not Dutch, you're not much, and was super proud of being Dutch. The Netherlands isn't exactly known for having a huge Jewish population. But Amber thought, hey, maybe my family is descended from the small minority of Dutch Jews living there. She rushed to tell her dad. My dad was like, oh, interesting. Like, you know, you learn something new every day. Like, I can't, you know. And that was it. And that really could have been it. But then one day, a year after she got her DNA results, there was a notification waiting for her on 23andMe. I got a message from someone that said, hi, we matched as half-sisters. Are you donor-conceived? And I'll never forget, I was at work, and I felt like my stomach, like, fell out of my body. Like, I was just so confused. Donor-conceived? It's not exactly a phrase you hear every day. I had to even, like, think about what that meant for a second. I was like, wait a minute. It wasn't in my vocabulary. It wasn't something I'd ever thought about. Donor-conceived means, well, to be conceived through a sperm or egg donor or both through an embryo donation. Amber read and reread the messages from this strange woman and answered her question. I think I said something really cheesy like, nope, I was conceived the old fashioned way, ha ha. Amber made that joke, but she knew this was serious. Because the more we exchanged messages, the more my spidey son started to go off that like, Actually, something really big is happening here, but I couldn't put my finger on it. The more Amber learned about this woman, Caitlin, the stranger things got. She grew up um, about 20 minutes from where I grew up. We had a lot in common. We were the exact same age. And she started sending me photos, and I was like, wow, this girl like looks like me, looks like other people in my family. It wasn't just that they looked alike. Caitlin was born just three weeks before Amber, 
and they both grew up in the Albany, New York area, on opposite ends of the same road. In high school, they went to the same basement punk shows. They were so similar. I couldn't believe that this was real. It's just like, it's hard to not feel like you're a clone or a freak or some kind of like crazy science fiction story. Caitlin said her mom used a sperm donor and suggested that Amber's mother had also. But that was completely contrary to what Amber knew about her own life. I had been raised my entire life that I was this miracle baby. Amber's parents had tried to get pregnant for years before having her. She had heard that story a lot growing up. And Amber is incredibly close with her father. They have a ton in common. They both have curly hair, they have the same sense of humor, and they both love the same kinds of music. Amber is, in so many ways, her father's daughter. At this point, I was firmly like, this girl is my half-sister because my father is her father. Amber wasn't buying this whole sperm donor thing, but she reached out to a person who could tell her for sure, her dad. She texted him and told him about Caitlin, and then she asked, have you ever been a sperm donor? But Amber's dad said he had never donated sperm, so that only left one possible explanation for her genetic connection to Caitlin. Amber's father must have cheated on her mother, and Caitlin, this stranger, her half-sister, was her dad's secret love child. That's like where I had landed at this point. My dad had an affair. This is my half-sister. And I was like ready to accept that. (laughs) It just, it was just a, a foregone conclusion to me. There had to be another answer. There was no way that my father of 30 years was not my biological father. It was impossible. After messaging with Caitlin all day at work and learning more and more about her, Amber's mind was spiraling. She got in the car and headed home from the office. But as she was driving, she became consumed with the idea that Caitlin was the product of her dad's indiscretions, of this illicit affair. Amber wanted answers then and there. She pulled the car over, called her dad, and hit record. Amber? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, what's up? What's up? That conversation next, after the break. It's just very cold here. I wish yep. I wore my winter jacket today. It's supposed to be cold up here tonight. There, there are a stand across the chance of frost again tonight. Mm. Oh, yeah. Why did you decide to record that call with your parents? I kind of have this thing in my life where, like, and I'm sure a lot of people do, where, like, if you have an emotional conversation with someone, sometimes you're so overwhelmed by the emotion of what's being discussed that then when you try to, like, replay the conversation, you're like, well, did they actually say that? Or am I coloring their words with my perception? So to me, I was like, I need to record this conversation for my own sanity because I know that this is going to, like, whatever is said in this conversation is going to change my life. Hold on, we'll put your speakerphone. Amber could sense something was off pretty quickly. Her dad put her on speaker and her mom joined the conversation. Hey, hey, Amber, dad, dad just had taken a couple pictures of him and I. We've, we've been in our chance. Kind of unusual for a casual father-daughter chat. But this wasn't a casual call. Amber was ready to confront her dad about his affair and his secret love child, Caitlin. Amber could have decided to wait to talk to her dad in private, But she couldn't just let this go, even if it meant dropping a bomb on her mother. I wanted to talk to you guys about something, though. Amber's mom and dad declined to speak with me for this show, but they did give us permission to use this recording. So, Mom, I told Dad, but there is a girl on 23andMe, the DNA test we did. Okay. Um, And genetically, she's my half-sister. 
right. Well, this has been heavy on my heart, honey. There's a good chance that girl is your uh, half-sister. In this moment, Amber's father could have come clean about his affair. Except there was no affair with Caitlin's mom. A new secret emerged. Back in the 1980s, Amber's parents were having trouble getting pregnant, so they went to a fertility doctor. There was a genetic thing between, uh, some sort of a chromosome thing between dad and I. They were told if they had a baby naturally, the child might not survive. When we talked with, uh, um, you know, a specialist, they had said that that um, we'd be better best not to to take the chance. Amber's mom said she started getting artificially inseminated with donor sperm. But, you know, it didn't work a couple times. And so this this one time, Dad and I ended up having sex. And when I became pregnant, we said, no matter what. Amber's parents had been trying to conceive for a year. It was a long process. So when her mom finally got pregnant, they decided they'd have this baby no matter what. No matter if the baby had a potentially terminal condition. No matter if they weren't sure who the father really was. Her parents were going to have a baby. To have Amber. No matter what. Wow. Um, yeah. So we just chose never to find out. Okay. Well, listen, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Um, That's why I heard that when you started, when you even started to look into the genetics, it just, that was so worried because we so hoped ever that... But it's just that I was so concerned, like, well, what do you guys think of me? I love you. Are you kidding? Why would I think any differently? I am so glad to hear that it, it doesn't make any difference to you. It's just sure as hell you're going to make no difference to me. I feel terrible that... I kind of forced you guys into this. Oh, wow. Um, so we were afraid um, you were going to be, be upset that we never went and had a blood test on to see whether or not. We, we didn't want to know. I'm so sorry, Mom. I, I know. Um, I, no, it's, don't, don't. It's, it's, it's okay, honey. You know, the, the thing is the way mom and dad have always been with you. That when you get down to asking with the truth, we have to tell you the truth. Just wish you never asked it. About a year after that call, when I spoke to Amber about it in 2018, her emotions were still very raw. And she told me there was one more thing her parents said to her before they hung up the phone that day. The last thing they said to me is, don't tell anyone. This is our secret. You can't tell anyone. And I was in such a state of shock, I just couldn't speak. Um, This is like two years ago, and I still get a little, sorry. (laughs) I just remember feeling like I had all of the air sucked out of my body. And I called my husband, and I was crying so hard I couldn't even talk. He thought I had gotten in a car accident. And he just kept yelling, what's wrong, what's wrong? 
I said, my father's not my father. This bombshell made Amber doubt everything. It was like a blaring, bright light had come on and revealed these deep, dark secrets. I woke up the next morning, and I remember the first thing that popped in my head when I woke up is, you don't know who your dad is, and you don't know who you are. Amber was desperate to know more, especially about her donor. What did her parents know about him? It turns out, not much. They admitted that they didn't have any information about him. It was completely anonymous. When I first heard Amber's story, it's this detail that really perplexed me. How was it possible that her parents had no information on the donor? Her mother had been inseminated by a doctor at a fertility clinic. Was there really no information about this man? But it turns out I shouldn't have been so surprised. For more than a century, secrecy and anonymity have been the bedrock of the baby business. This hush-hush approach has been critical for everyone involved, from the doctors, to the donors, to the patients. For my generation and older generations, our parents were literally told by their doctors, don't ever tell anyone, don't tell your child. Shame around infertility was a big force behind this kind of advice. There also used to be some practicality to all this secrecy. Even if you told a child they were donor-conceived, finding that donor would have been nearly impossible before the internet and DNA. So it's easy to see why so many parents didn't bother to bring it up. But now, for the first time, donor-conceived people are holding information they weren't supposed to have. Information that doctors and the industry didn't even believe they could have when these people were born. Yet, even with at-home DNA tests, it's still extremely difficult for donor-conceived people like Amber to access information about their biological parents. Just think about it. Amber might have done a 23andMe, but she hadn't matched with her donor. She didn't know his name, where he was from, how old he was, or if he was even still alive. I had thought, like, going into this process, like, there's a very, very good chance you will never find this person. You will never know who they are. You will never speak to them. But Amber did have one clue to go off of. My name is Caitlin, she, her, hers, and I am 34 years old. Amber was my first half-sibling that popped up. Uh, yeah. The first meeting between Amber and Caitlin and their plan to track down their donor. That's next. Despite all their similarities, Caitlin's story is a lot different from Amber's. When she was growing up about 20 minutes away from Amber, it was just Caitlin and her mom. My uh, legal father, whose name is on my birth certificate uh, and who was married to my mom at the time that I was conceived, uh, they split when I was one years old, and I never really met him. Even though he wasn't in her life, when Caitlin was a kid, she had a lot of questions about her dad. Do I look like him? And do I, you know, act like him? Do I have any, like, quirks like him? And when she was around 13 years old, Caitlin's mother gave her some answers. I remember uh, distinctly, I was decorating the Christmas tree with my mom. And I was asking just a bunch of questions. My mom just kind of was, like, took a deep breath and, like, sat me down on the couch and was like, all right, Let's, let's talk this out. Caitlin's mom told her that the man listed on Caitlin's birth certificate wasn't her dad. She told her that Caitlin had been born through a sperm donor. And when it came to Caitlin's dad... I think she thought that it might be helpful for me to understand that he wasn't my biological father. That, you know, like abandoned me basically. So, um, so for me, it made a lot of sense, and it was sort of a relief to know that that person wasn't my father. 
Learning she was donor-conceived was a relief for Caitlin, but it also raised a whole host of other questions. As I got older, I was just always curious. Like, curious, do I have siblings? Curious if I looked like my father. I never thought I really looked too much like my mom, so I was always super curious what he looked like. When Caitlin did her 23andMe test and saw Amber was in her results... For me, it was like a a big, like, aha moment. Like, finally... Um, so I was super excited. I immediately Google stalked her and was looking for any and all information and pictures I could find. Uh, the first thing that popped up was her Facebook, and I saw her f- profile photo and was like, oh yeah, this is definitely my sister. Caitlin had known she was donor-conceived for more than a decade. By this point, it wasn't some mystery. It was part of her identity. So finding Amber was satisfying. But for Amber, this revelation was sudden, and it came with a bunch of urgent questions. Among the most pressing, who the hell was her biological father? All they had been told was that he was uh, a med school student, and that he was healthy, and that he was tall with blonde hair and blue eyes, which my dad is a pretty tall guy with curly blonde hair and and light eyes, and that they were just going to try to... physically match him as close as possible to my dad. Amber wanted to know more, so she turned to the one person likely to have some information, a person who was a stranger just a few days prior, Caitlin, her half-sister. They decided to do a video chat. And I just remember the instant that the FaceTime connected, I just, like, I was in shock seeing her in motion and hearing her voice, our voices are very similar. (laughs) Um, It just all clicked. Like that was the moment that I think it all like really, really sunk in for me that this was real and this was happening. And Caitlin felt the same way when she saw Amber. It was like bizarro version of myself because we had the same mannerisms and quirks and speech patterns, and we have the same voice. Amber grew up thinking she looked like her dad, which is not shocking to me, considering that her parents said the fertility clinic tried to select a donor who closely resembled her father. But video chatting with Caitlin blew up that notion. Seeing myself in another person in this way, and then also as we spoke, like learning how much we had in common and how much our lives had overlapped was just like, it was the best possible feeling. Amber and Caitlin got to know each other, and then Amber got down to the business at hand. She started asking questions, and she got some valuable answers from Caitlin. She knew where we were conceived. She knew all of the details. Um, She just didn't know who our donor was or if we had any other uh, siblings. She had been looking since she was 15. After Amber and Caitlin connected, they started their search at the clinic where they were conceived. They tried to call for answers, but discovered it no longer existed. However, even if it had been open, it was unlikely they would have found anything. And that's because the FDA only requires fertility clinics to keep records for 10 years, meaning that a person would have to both know they are donor-conceived and take steps to get records about who their donor is by the time they reach their 10th birthday. And if the clinic closes, there is no law that says those records need to be maintained in any way for donor-conceived people to access in the future. This is a running joke in the donor-conceived community that the clinics don't exist, and if they do, they've all been hit by floods, fires, you know, for whatever reason, mysteriously, all the records are gone. With or without access to clinic records, Amber and Caitlin were grateful to just find each other. But they did have one other lead to go off of when it came to locating their donor. So they returned to the place that set this all in motion, 23andMe. 
So after Caitlin and I talked, we realized we'd both matched with these two guys as first cousins. So I was like, okay, that's our donor's nephew. We weren't sure, right? There could be other sort of situations afoot, but that would be like the most traditional sort of connection to them. They tried Googling these two guys, but they had really common names. So, you know, I wasn't really having any luck there. I didn't know where they lived. I didn't know kind of any other identifying features. Even with the power of Google, they had hit another dead end. But then, a few weeks after Amber reached out on 23andMe, one of these cousins, the potential nephew of her and Caitlin's donor, messaged Amber back. And he was like, oh my God, this is so nuts. Like, how are we related? How do I know you? Amber's young cousin, she said he appeared to be in his late teens or early 20s, suggested they connect on Facebook. They started messaging, and she was keeping Caitlin updated the whole time. And Caitlin and I are texting, and she's just sending me all these, like, GIF reactions of like, oh my God, oh my God. And I just remember feeling like, like a cold sweat on the back of my neck. I was just like you know, like like a movie montage of someone just, like, you know, furiously typing. Amber and Caitlin had another clue, an important detail that would potentially help them track down their donor. Caitlin's mom had told her that the donor was supposedly a doctor who was in the program at the clinic, like an intern at the clinic, basically. This matched what Amber knew. One of the few concrete details Amber's parents were told about the donor was that he had been a student in med school. So while Amber was messaging back and forth with her young cousin, she asked him a seemingly innocuous question. Do you have an uncle who's a doctor? And he said, I have one uncle and he's a doctor. Bingo. Amber told the young man that she believed his uncle was her biological father. She told him that she and Caitlin were conceived with the same sperm donor, and that's how they were all related. Amber asked the young man for his uncle's full name, but he wouldn't give it to her. And he was like, I don't know about this. I'm kind of freaked out. I need to talk to my mom. And I was like, that's cool. Um, I'm not trying to, like, blow up your family. Um, You know, really, I I just want a name, and I just want to know, you know, You know, does anybody in your family have, like, terminal cancer? Like, am I going to die when I'm, like, 30? Um, Is there anything I kind of, like, need to know? The young man told Amber that he'd reach out to his family to discuss all of this. But Amber had already friended this guy on Facebook, so she started to search through his friends list. She found a man that had the same last name as her first cousin. He looked to be in his late 50s or early 60s. She clicked on his profile and started scanning his photos and stared at the screen. And there was no mistaking, this was my father. The man in the photo looked a lot like Amber. Their eyes, their smiles even the way they were standing in the pictures. And Caitlin felt the same way. This man looked like her. As soon as I saw of his picture, I was like, yeah, that's, that's definitely, I definitely came from him. Amber Googled this man's name and found his LinkedIn profile. It said he was a doctor. He had attended Albany Medical College the same place that Amber and Caitlin's mothers went for artificial insemination. And he was a student there the year Caitlin and Amber were born. I was like, okay, I think we have a match. So at that point I started screenshotting (laughs) everything. um, And I sent it to my sister and I was like, I found him. And so from there we kind of hatched a plan of like how we were going to contact him. It was just so exciting. I couldn't contain myself. But what if the donor didn't want to be found? I was kind of like, no, you know, no, no, don't tell her anything, you know. 
No. That's next time on Biohacked Family Secrets. Biohacked Family Secrets is produced by 3 Uncanny 4 and Sony Music Entertainment. I'm your host, TJ Raphael. Our program is edited by Maureen McMurray. Our producers are Nick Mott, Krista Ripple, Shane McKeon, and Jennifer Siegel. Jenny Kim is our production manager, and Alicia Baitoup composed the theme. Our fact checkers are Will Tavlin and Ava Ahmed Behi. This episode was mixed by Joanna Catcher at Nice Manners. Special thanks to Laura Mayer, Nuna Sharafadeen, Amy Eason, Jennifer Womack, and Allison Sherry. Have a question or comment about this week's show? Send me a tweet at TJ Raphael or email us at biohacked at 3 4com For 3 Uncanny 4 and Sony Music Entertainment, I'm TJ Raphael. <laughs> <laughs>